Hello, this is Mike Swanson of uh, WallStreetWindow.com. I've got a very special guest with me today. I'm speaking uh, for the first time this year with Ike Iosa, who runs the website MarketViews.tv. How are you doing today, Ike? I'm you all, Mike. Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to our listeners. And uh, thank you for having me as a guest once again. Oh, definitely. Well, this is, you know, to me, probably the most important time of year to you know, look at the markets and try to plan ahead for the rest of the year. What's the tone going to be like this year? Uh, what, you know, what, where are we going to make money and what do we got to watch out for? So I'm very happy to uh, talk with you about the charts that uh, you sent me. Well, Mike, I think we need to have a roadmap at the beginning of the year. So to have an idea of where things may go. And um, this way we can adjust our strategy or our tactic uh, accordingly. So one of the things that I do early each year is to take a look at some real long-term charts. And for me, the point of reference is the 1980-1982 video. That is where I start because the most of us have lived throughout that year, that period. We remember what has been like the last 30, 40 years. But also that was the beginning of the last great secular trend. The bull market in equities, the bear market in interest rates. So that's why I use that period as my starting point, my reference point. And the first chart we are going to take a look at is the yield on the 10-year treasury. Now we can see that from 1982 until now it's been a clear downtrend. Along the way we have had some typical classical bear market rallies. Uh, these are the ones that I have circled with and we're in it, so something of a rally now. Yeah, but if you look at this downtrend, okay, uh, there are two things that we can point out. The one is we have had, we have had five bear market rallies. These are the, those sharp rallies, the bottom type of rallies that fell, okay? And we have had two rallies. Uh, one of them that have failed, that is the one in A, this we saw from 2002 to 2007, yields tried to form a double bottom, a double bottom which failed. And then we went to, again, lower yields in 2008, sharp rally, and now we have had another double bottom the last four years. And the question is whether this double bottom holds or not. Given the level of interest rates and in the absence of any systemic danger out there, I would imagine that this double bottom holds, which means at the very minimum rates can rise up to the declining top line, which is at 3%. Okay. And throughout the last 36 years, we have seen yields rising up to that line. I mean, that's not abnormal at all. So going up to 3%, to me, would not be surprising. Now, the real game changer, so to speak, would be if we have a breakout above the percent. In that case, then the next upside target would be around 4%. The next set of charts I would like to take a look at is how bond prices over the last 36, 38 years have affected stocks, the dollar, and of course gold. So the next chart, chart number two, we can see on top yields and on the bottom the stock market. 
clearly the main beneficiary out of lower interest rates has been the stock market. Well, that's one argument I remember in, that was really commonplace in 2015, 2014, was that uh, on CNBC, I would hear people say that, well, yeah, the stock market has a high valuation from a historical standpoint, from price to sales ratios, price to earnings ratio, but because rates are so low, it deserves to be uh, highly valued because it's the only way you can get any interest. Well, actually, that is the easy explanation. I believe there is also something else, at least for the last four or five years, behind the continuous rise in um, stock prices. That has to do with buybacks. Mm. Now, when in business, when we consider capital investment, okay. One of the, I mean, the main principle through which we make decisions is that the IRR, which is the internal rate of return for the investment, has to exceed the cost of capital. If the IRR does not exceed the cost of capital, then you simply don't make the investment. When the cost of capital is zero, as it has been the last you know, few years, then no IRR actually um, uh, is necessary, okay? I mean, even if you have a you know point five return, you still your IRR exceeds the zero cost of money. What that means is it has become very easy for corporations to borrow, is you know for the purpose of financing stock buybacks, and that has been one of the main leaders behind the rise the last three four years. Nevertheless. Um, of course, when you look, you know, at, at stocks, um, as the Nasdaq gives you a, a cash flow stream, actually the net present value increases when interest rates go down. So, from a valuation point, yes, lower interest rates to a degree can justify higher stock prices, but that is to a degree, not to infinity. So, anyway, um, let's take a look at the next chart. Okay. That's uh, chart number three. And I just want to make again the, the point that I made earlier that if you look at the stock market from 86 until 2007, okay, we can see that each time interest rates had a sharp rise after the declining top line, then either we had a short stock market decline or a sideways action. In 87 we had the crash, in 1994, uh, uh, beginning of 95, we had a flat market, a sideways market, okay? Then the rise going up to 2000 was followed by the bear market, and I'm not saying that the rise in the state was the reason for the bear market, was a contributing factor. And then again, once from 2003, interest rates got up to the declining top line, what happened? We had the bear market of uh, 2008, 2009. Again, higher rates were not the reason, was a contributing factor. My point is that what we have seen the last 36 years is that each time the interest rate get up to the decline top line, that has coincided with stock market top. Well, that would mean if that bear, if the bull market or bear market in, in the yields uh, that began in the early 80s were to turn into a bull market going through 5%, uh, 4%, <laughs> that would be bad for stocks. Of course, it would, it would take be, time think, for that to happen, but... It also has to do with where you're starting from, okay? Mm -hmm. Initially, I think higher yields would not bother the market that much. Okay. The explanation for it would be, well, this is good. This is good because it means yields are going down because we're getting high economic growth. Okay. okay? That would be the initial reaction. Uh, 
the actual will change once we pass the threshold of 4%. Mm. So I think between 3 and 4, you may get a reaction, but I don't think that will also mean the end of the bull market. I think above 4% will definitely be uh, a real problem. Between 3 and 4, I'm not all that sure. And as I said, once we get up to 3%, we'll probably get a, a reversal in the, in the market. But uh, the explanation will be, well, this is good, economic growth sure. is accelerating, so let's buy stocks again. The point is, you got to watch out as we get close to 3%. Okay. Now, the, the next chart, which is a comparison uh, with the U.S. dollar. Now, the common wisdom out there is that um, higher rates usually lead to high currency. Well, that's not necessarily, you know, the truth, okay? Because we can see here that rates, you know, were going down from 82 to 86. Of course, the dollar had a big plan, it was down 50%. But then, as rates, you know, uh, went lower from 88 until 2002, well, the dollar rally. I mean, we had uh, a pretty good you know, dollar rally from 92 until yeah. almost 2002, 14 years. Yeah. During that period, the rates were going down, and yet the dollar was rising. And that will happen. From 2002 to 2006, rates went up. The dollar lost about 30%. Hmm. So, and, and then also, if you look at the last few years, from 2014 to 2016, rates went sharply down, the dollar went sharply up. So the common wisdom that have, you know, referring to interest rates and the currency having a positive correlation uh, is not all that accurate. I mean, this chart is telling us, at least uh, when it comes to the relation between the dollar and in the face, it's mixed. The record is mixed. I mean, I don't say that, the chart says that. But what about so next, gold? Well, that's our next chart. Okay. Okay. The next chart, again, goes back to 1980. Now, the common wisdom out there is that high rates are bad for gold, and vice versa, low rates are good for gold. All right, well, let's, let's take a look at the chart going back to 1980. Now, we see what? From 82 until 98, for 16 years, rates were going down. At the same time, gold was going down. Actually, yeah. forming a bottom, but nevertheless, from a high of like 700, went down to about 280, 275, if I'm not mistaken, during the same period. Then, we have low rates from 2006 until 2012 and during that time the dollar uh, I mean gold I'm sorry gold had a spectacular rally from 275 all the way up to 1900 so over the last 36 years we have two periods to which for 16 years either states went down the dollar went down and then about 10 years Interest rates went down and down, down and the gold went up. So again, when you try to tie gold and interest rates, the record is mixed, at least for the last 38 years. From comparing these three charts, when you look at interest rates, gold, the dollar, and equities, the clear, undisputable beneficiary is equities. Right, sure. Dollar, the record is mixed. So, the question now is, where are interest rates going? Okay, the chart shows we're close to the top of the range. Okay, if you look at the fundamentals of bonds for 2018, one thing I'm going to keep in mind is that in 2018, there's going to be uh, an additional supply in sovereign debt. 
of about 800 billion. Now, because of the purchases from the Fed and the ECB, in 2017, we had a net demand of 250 billion. That was the bonds that were issued, okay, versus the, I mean, the, we had an income of 250 billion, as I said. However, in 2018, we're going to have, at this going to be the reverse, we're going to have about 800 billion uh, in debt that's going to be issued, and that will result in a 500 billion net supply for 2018. So we're going from net demand of 250 billion to a net supply of 500 billion. That alone, the difference between supply and demand between 2017 and 2018, all to result in higher interest rates. Then, another thing is that my good friend Jim Roth uh, from Microtype did an excellent um, research paper regarding the spread between the U6 and the U3 unemployment rate. Now the U3 unemployment rate, which is the, is the official uh, unemployment rate, is the percentage of people who are out of work and have looked for work for the last four weeks. The U6 rate is the U3 plus the underemployed and um, the discouraged. And for many, this is the true unemployment rate. And what Jim Wolf did is that he examined the spread between the two because um, when the spread narrows, it means that the slack between the official unemployment rate and the and U6 is getting smaller. That means we're having I mean, those who were discouraged are no longer discouraged, they're finding work. Those who were underemployed and wanted to find food work, they have found, or they are finding you know, food work. And what Jim Wolf has found is that when the spread is around 3.5, that is when um, wage uh, increased pressures start to appear. And that's when we start to get uh, wage inflation. Right now, it's at 3.8, okay? So we're at a threshold where wage push inflation begin to take hold. Another thing that we need to take into consideration is that the impact of the tax cut is full and loaded. That means we got to have higher economic growth in 2018 and 2019. I don't think we're going to have the four or five or six percent growth that you know is advertised. I think we're looking at between 2.9 3.1, but 2.9 to 3.1 economic growth, that's a very good rate. That's the rate that does not give the Fed much room uh, to not go through with raising rates. And the last but not least, if you look at the PMI in US and Europe, it's at multi-month highs. Normally, when you put all these four factors together, they lead to higher rates. So, it seems to me that global economic growth, inflation, and the net bond supply will rise in 2018, and that implies higher interest rates. The question is, do we go above 3%, to go above 4%? Above 4% to me looks, at the moment, kind of, you know, excessive. But I would expect, you know, yields from the 10-year Treasury to go up to three and perhaps as much as four percent. So to put it, you know, all together, I think if you're patient and you have an horizon, uh, a time horizon, anywhere between one to two years, uh, a part of one portfolio would be to be short bonds. Now, our uh, next two charts, I have TLT and uh, the yield on the 10-year uh, treasury. Now, TLT is for the 20-year, but that is one of the most known um, ETFs, that's why I use it. 
Now, TLC has the potential to go all the way from where it's at now down to 90. As we speak, it's at 124. So that's roughly a 74 point decline. That's about 25% over the next uh, year, maybe two years. So sorting TLT or you know, it's, it's, uh, buying an ETF, uh, like you suggested, to short uh, junk bonds, to me, for the next one to two years, is a is a trade worth taking? Let me ask you this. Um, yeah, I, I I own a as you mentioned, I own a junk bond that's that's a short uh, junk bond ETF. Uh, but one thing interesting about it is because I guess because the <laughs> the stock market volatility is so low, the VIX is so low that I didn't do it. But I noticed the options on these various bond ETFs seem to have extremely low volatility premium. So I was almost tempted to do that too. Buy puts on, say, you know, on the junk bond ETFs or on TLT or something. Well, yeah, and uh, possibly you can know, buy puts, you know, going out, you know, one, two, three years. Yeah. I mean, I would buy, you know, uh, deep in the money puts going out, you know, a couple of years. Because, let's put it another way. If bond yields from here went lower, they would go lower for one reason only. Some sort of black swan event. Yeah. <laughs> okay? So, um, that is something that cannot be predicted or, you know, foreseen. Well, that's but, why you don't bet put all your money on one bet. <laughs> so. Exactly. So, anyway, uh, let's move on to the next topic okay. that is very interesting, and that is um, the, it's chart number eight, okay? And what we have here is the US dollar on top and gold. And what we see is just like equities and lower yields have a very close correlation. We also see a very close correlation between the dollar and gold. Going back to 1980, we see that each bottom in gold has corresponded with the top in the dollar. There was only a very short period, the one um, that I have highlighted between uh, early 1992 and um, I believe uh, late 1994, where the dollar went up and gold went up a little bit before it had its final mm. uh, plunge into 1999. Okay. Now the interesting thing is, right as we speak, gold is very close to resistance around 1400, and the dollar is not all that far from support around 87 and a half, 88, the dollar index, okay? So, it seems to me that we have right here 36 years, 38 years of negative correlation between these two assets, with the exception of, of, of a very short one and a half year period back in 1992. It would seem to me that something here you know, will break. Either we get a breakdown in the dollar and a breakout in gold, or we get a reversal in the dollar and then a reversal in gold. So that is a chart that I really you know, keep in mind. It will, well, fact. either one would take the way it's lined up. It would occur in the next couple months. Well, yeah, and the next two charts, chart, chart nine, and chart 10 uh, show the uh, potential outcomes. On the left, I have the dollar, okay? Now, one could argue that the dollar is putting a very large double bottom, okay? The, uh, the first, uh, the left bottom was from 86 to, to 96, 
the second bottom from uh, 2004 until 2014. You can't argue with that. I mean, there is, there is a possibility, mm -hmm. okay? You can uh, list many fundamental reasons why this should not be the case, but forget what the title says, forget that is the US dollar, just look at the chart. If you did okay. not know, if you did not know this was the dollar, if you just somebody showed you this chart, wouldn't you consider the possibility of sure, a double sure. bottom? Yeah, well, that's my point, okay? So, right here, if you were, you know, we're having a long-term bottle double bottom that can lead to a very sharp rally in the dollar, or if we get a breakdown here, that means we will have a triple top. The first one in 84, second one in um, 2002, mm. and the third one in 2016, okay? Which, if that is a triple top formation, then we can see the dollar index down to about 60, 65. That's one possibility. That's one scenario. Now, next start, right next to it, okay? I'm showing the same thing with gold. Here we also have two probable scenarios. If gold holds above the rising trend line, which means all the decline that we have had from 2011 until now, it was just uh, corrected, then the next outlet could, e could easily take gold up to you know, $3,000, $4,000. On the other hand, uh, if instead of a base formation, what we were looking at is a double top, which fails around 1400 uh, then um, you could easily see gold down to 700. So you look at these two charts, and what is important to me, outside, you know, one's convictions, because the easiest way to lose money is to have very strong convictions, <laughs> you know, and not change your mind when the chart is telling you something else, is that both the dollar and gold are arguing that we're going to have significant moves in these two. Mm, mm -hmm. And people ought to be prepared is uh, watch out which way the break comes and then position themselves because whichever uh, the direction of the move is going to be a great move. Right, and it will be starting this year. Or in yeah, months. It, happens, it should be happening in the next you know, few months. Yeah. So, the next you know, two great trades that are lining up for 2018 is the positions in gold and dollar. Now, right where it's at, we are very you know, close. I would imagine that whatever this will happen, you know, will happen over the next, you know, a few months. At least that's what the chart shows. Okay. And um, the next chart, which is uh, chart number eleven, and that is something else I want people to pay attention to. Okay, this is a monthly chart of the U.S. dollar. Okay. And the formation that we have, the pattern that we have is the one of a megaphone. And now usually, and the emphasis, Mike, is on the word usually, because usually does not mean always, is that when you get to the bottom of the megaphone, after an ABCD type of move, you get a failed rally that takes you up to about um, half of the range, the middle of the range, I'm sorry, okay? so. The dollar is very close, as you can see, to the bottom of, of, of the megaphone, okay? So it could it happen that what we see here is a rally, a fail rally, that takes it up to the middle of the range, okay? So something that we also need to keep in mind is that if the dollar does not break down here, Okay, then for a couple of months, we can see a rally in the dollar and a reversal in gold. Uh, neither of these moves will reverse the long-term charts, okay, 
But uh, for a couple of you know months or maybe three months, um, could throw a wrench in the gear. Okay. Uh, I said uh, the, my opinion is based on the chart. The oh, chart sure. There was a megaphone pattern. So how do megaphone patterns resolve? Like you know, usually, not always. At the end, you get a fellow rally. Well, it's, it's it's lining up. You know, the next you know the rally would take place within months, so we'll we'll be able to uh, see it and and position use it to position ourselves. It, exactly, exactly. So. Anyway, what well, what do you think as we wrap up? Uh, do you have a thing about the, the U.S. equities uh, uh, in the in the in the targets? You're yeah, Mike. Last in the past. year, okay, we did four interviews, and I have the dates of the interviews. The okay, interviews, uh, where the S and P was at when we did the interview, and based on the regression analysis that we used, what the possible target could be. Now, what I want to uh, say about this is, of course, obviously, obviously I cannot um, tell you, and this is a proprietary you know, indicator, so I cannot tell you the, the what goes into the um, uh, regression equation that, that we're using, but I can tell you this. It has to do with the rate of change in the internals, like New highs, new lows, cumulative volume, um, okay. easy line, and usually when the internals are improving, that would give us higher targets. When they are deteriorating, that would give us lower targets, uh, either lower upside targets or lower uh, low targets. Okay, downside targets. All right. What I want to point out is this: like in a, in a uh, October 14th, 2016, okay, the S&P was 2164, and we had a target of 2350. That target was 8.5% higher from where we were when we did the interview, okay? When we did our next interview in April, the S&P was at 2355. Uh, the upside target we were getting at the time was 2470. That was 4.8 percent higher. Okay, if you if you compare these two, what has happened between October of 2016 and April of 2017 is that the upside target, the next upside target, has been lowered by about four percent. Why? Because we have this duration in the internal. Then we go to May. The S&P was at 2000, uh, 2416 on May 26, and I gave you a target for 25 to 2575, which was 6.5% higher. We met that one. And then when we did our last interview um, in October, actually we did two, one October and one in November. The S&P was at 2575, and at the time I said, by the end of the year, we had a target of 2650, 2675. The SME closed at 2673 uh, on um, December 29. Okay. Now, that upside target, you know, was the lowest uh, of the year. You can see we started with an 8.5% projection. The next one was 4.8%, 6.5% down to 3.7%. What was your next target now even lower? Or, well, or is it improving now? Well, that is what I'm getting at. That's okay. the next point. <laughs> okay. So now when we run our, our possible upside projection for this year, one thing that I want to uh, clarify is this. For a target to become valid, okay, uh, it means uh, that the previous one it has not been exceeded and has it has to have held as a support. Okay, if the previous target has exceeded and then it has not held as support, I mean, what was the distance? Then it's not hold as support. Okay, then that means it's no longer valid. Okay. 
Well, so I'm going to give you, you know, some targets okay. for this year, okay? Assuming interest rates do not exceed 3%. Now, this is very important, okay? okay. Because one of the assumptions in uh, the equation that we use is that interest rates are uh, steady, all right? If you look at the chart that we have right below, Okay, again, go back to 1980. We can see that it has been for since 2009 in a very narrow channel, and the top of that channel comes around 2,900. Okay, that's simply looking at the chart. All right, in using our proprietary uh, formula, then the target that we have is 2805-2815. If that target was to be exceeded and hold the support, then the next one would be 2875-2905. If that target is exceeded and then it holds a support, then the next one would be 2985-2005. I want you to understand that this is not a forecast. I'm not saying that by the end of the year, the S&P is going to 3,005. What I'm saying is we have a roadmap. If the S&P exceeds one of these targets, then we'll go to the next one. If it fails at any of these targets, then what we do, we go back and re-estimate what we have, uh, what's going to happen, you know, going forward, because it means something has changed, okay? So, this is not the forecast. These are, this is a roadmap. If these targets are met, we go to the next one. If one of them is not met, the market fails, then uh, at that point, we we'll rerun our analysis and uh, we'll see what the targets are. Could be a little higher. It could be lower, much lower. We know that when we get there. Okay. Well, on um, January the first, uh, 2017, Bitcoin was around a thousand, and it hit twenty thousand in December. So it went up nineteen, it went from one thousand to twenty thousand, and this S and P is at around twenty eight hundred, let's say. And why should anyone buy the S and P at twenty eight hundred? When Bitcoin can go from one thousand to twenty thousand, is so much more, and it can make the gains the S and P can take a year to make in an hour. Sure, you can. Uh, the thing, Mike, you know, is this: Look, I have said, you know, before, you know, previous news, I believe the blockchain technology is a is for here to stay. Now, some of the things that I observe when it comes to Bitcoin me are even familiar with the things that you and I and uh, those of us who were in the market 20 years ago, we saw in 1999. Uh, these two pictures, I took them just a couple of days ago. I was on Facebook and these ads appeared. As you can see, uh, they're advertising that you can buy Bitcoin using your bank card. In other words, you can get your visa and um, you know buy Bitcoin and become rich. <laughs> it's not all that different. I mean, for those of us who lived through, you know, the internet bubble of, you know, 2000, it's not all that different from the Ameritrade commercial where a truck driver, um, you know, was telling his, um, a guy got told his, his car that, that he owned an island, okay? It's not all that different from um, examples that I have mentioned several times, where like a small coal mining company in Virginia set up their website. And the day they set up their website, which just gave information about the company, okay? The stock tripled. Well, notice how many people have hit the love button on these two ads. <laughs> it just got fun. It's just, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, look, when, I, listen, the marketing, I mean, the risk tolerance for each and every one of us, you know, is different. And so is our life experience. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, you see advertisements that uh, you can become rich by buying something which 
um, you charge it on your credit card, probably it's way, it's probably it's late. Um, you could have become rich when you were just 1,000, okay? Um, right now, maybe it's late. But, I mean, these advertisements, I mean, they're simply on the global evidence. But anyone who's been, you know, in the business uh, and had experienced other bubbles, you can't help it but see the similarities. Well, I, I, I will say, you know, over the past couple months, say, since Labor Day, Definitely, you know, Bitcoin has gone up. It's made a big move. It's taken everyone, you know, in the United States, they're talking about on CNBC now, on Fast Money, they've been devoting about 15 minutes, usually talking about it in one form or another. And it's really catching everyone's attention. It's like, I would say it's been the market move of last year that caught everyone's attention. Uh, and when a big move happens, uh, you know, people still remain focused on it, but the thing is about the, your charts and your presentation is Bitcoin was last year's story, and if gold or the dollar make the kind of moves uh, that your chart suggests, and I think we are going to see big moves, then that's going to be the story of this year. <laughs> so, what and you got to be ready for that. In your uh, Power Investor update, you have made a, a very good point. You know, focus on stocks that um, have to do with blockchain technology. And I think if you believe in the technology um, and you want to make an intermediate long term investment, probably owning, you know, uh, a basket of these stocks is the best way to go. Because I do think the technology is here to stay. Um, as far as Bitcoin is concerned, that, as I said, when you save an advertisement like that and you have lived through two bubbles, you become very skeptical. But I'm not skeptical with technology. Right, sure. Well, it's going to be an interesting year. And, you know, thank you for taking the time to go through this presentation with me and everyone else. And uh, we're going to be watching these charts. And the next couple of months are going to be very fascinating, to say the least. Uh, and, and these are all things I don't think people are paying any attention to, frankly. You know, the bond market and gold and the dollar, it's, it's, I think people really sleep on, on, on these things. Well, Mike, I'll say this is the time of the year to look at the long term charts and kind of like have in your head the roadmap of where things may go. So you can adjust your strategy and your tactics. Yeah, well, and as we wrap up, I'll just tell people if they want more information from, from you, go to your website, marketviews.tv, uh, and I'm sure we'll be talking again uh, sometime soon. Thank you, Mike. Have a great week.